We do not vote on resignations. You're voted in by your town. Go to your select board if you want to resign. Not here. So please drop the vote. Okay, is that a motion, uh, Jim? Yeah, the motion is to drop the vote for the resignations. Um, you're voted in by your town. This district has nothing to do with that. Is there a second? Yes. So moved. Okay, any further discussion on that? Your town, you ask your town if you can vote. You fill out a form, you put on your local town ballot. And if you are elected for your term, you then have to go and swear into your town clerk not the superintendent or anybody else over here. I mean, I know we're all kind of new, but that's the way it works. So I hope everybody agrees with that. And, you know, if you want to accept the resignations, you could accept them, but don't vote on them. Okay, um, any other discussion on that? All in favor of uh, amending the agenda to eliminate the vote, say aye. 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 Any against? All right, aye. then we will accept the agenda as amended. Are there any other amendments to the agenda? I, I just have a quick question. It says accept for resignation. So I thought it doesn't, where does it say we're voting on them? It says accept. And 5B, accept board resignations vote just to accept them. So, I mean, I think it doesn't matter, but I don't think there was a vote on whether or not, you know what I'm saying? I think it's semantics. I think we know these people are resigning, right? That's what we're all saying. You should have spoke up while we were asking. We already had a vote and we said we were amending the agenda to take it off of the agenda. I'm sorry, this was just in the, this was just in the, uh, the accept the yes or nay, and I, I was trying to unmute. Sorry, I'm not as, uh, as savvy in the computer as. Well, you're in person, maybe I should be there too. But anyway, if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, but I, I just read it a different way. It says a vote. Thank you. All right. Um, so the agenda has passed as amended and we are now have a time for public comment for anyone who's attending the meeting to uh, say something, uh, taking about one or two minutes, uh, and then also please tell us who you are and if there is somebody who would like to be recognized, um, please put your Zoom hand up or if you're in the conference room, you can, I can't really see you very well, so you'll just have to speak up. All right, Jamie Ziobro. Hi everyone, uh, Jamie Ziober, I'm a parent of a child in third grade at West and fifth grade at TPBS. Um, first, I wanted to thank Sherry, Susa, and Katie Burke for sharing the COVID vaccination rates by school last week. Um, that was really helpful information to have on hand. And I think as we all know, we're presently dealing with a substantial surge in COVID cases in our schools and communities. And it was nice to be able to see where each school stands with three respect to vaccination rates. So our school district should lead the way for Vermont and require vaccines for all staff. This is crucial in keeping our students and our community safe. Um, to maintain my employment, I had to provide a photo of my CDC vaccination card to my employer and the school district should do the same. Many local businesses and community organizations have vaccine requirements as do most of the largest school districts in the country. Um, would it be possible for the district to share the vaccination rates for the staff on a school by school basis as was done for the student body? This would be helpful information to have for both transparency and awareness for parents. And as if any of us need a, another reminder at this point, but vaccination remains the number one way to decrease community spread and the severity of illness from COVID-19. Finally, if a decision is made that the staff will not be required to be vaccinated against COVID, then at a minimum, N95, KN95, or KF94 masks should be required for all staff at all times. 
Unregulated face coverings that may or may not prevent the spread of COVID were wonderful public health strategies at the beginning of the pandemic, but there is now plenty of manufacturing capacity for high filtration masks that are proven to be much more effective at stopping the spread of COVID than cloth face coverings. Thank you. Sherry, I have a question. I thought like we were at a school building. How about that? I think what I hear Jamie saying is the kind of mask that we get. Oh, okay. Well, because also that's going to be vaccination. Right. For sure. Well, we have a, a community member here, uh, Carrie, that's here to speak. Okay, very good. Thank you. Good evening. Um, could you can, I'm sorry. You want to I don't know. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> My name is Sarah Charlton. I am a parent here in this district. Um, I have something I've prepared to read, so I can be a little more organized. Um, good evening, Sousa, members of the board, community members, and parents. First, I'd like to thank the team here at the school for working so hard to keep our children healthy and learning in school. I recognize and appreciate that there are many contributions that I know go on behind the scenes that are not recognized or properly thanked, including school boards. I've served a school board before and thank each of you for your service to our community. I noticed two board members were submitting their resignations tonight and would like to especially thank them for their service. I'd also like to thank Sherry Sousa for putting together a revised proposal for spectators to attend winter sports. I believe this plan that she has proposed in the middle school and high school is well thought out, balanced, and provides a framework for our children to be supported and continues to move forward. It also is similar to many area schools in their plans as they move forward. However, the elementary students are subject to a different requirement. They will be required to show a vaccine card or weekly test to participate in basketball. I'd like to understand why additional requirements are placed, being placed on the elementary program. As I understand it, the children in first, second, and third grade will not be playing games and will only be receiving instruction in basketball. The fifth, fifth and sixth grade will have games. Our neighbors in Windsor have no vaccine or testing requirement for elementary age children to enroll and participate in basketball and masks are optional. I would like to know if it would be possible to schedule the fifth and sixth grade games at the high school so that they too could have spectators, assuming that the reason they would not have spectators is because there wasn't room in a gym to socially distance. I'm not a parent of any elementary student. However, I believe it is important for us all to move forward as a community together with the same or similar guidelines wherever possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? Sherry, um, Todd asked if we can um, raise the volume somehow. No, no. Okay. One person has their hand up. Okay, I cannot see a hand up. <laughs> I'm Nicole McKeon. Okay, Nicole, yes. All right, <clears throat> sorry, I, I couldn't get my, my Zoom hand to go up. Um, I, I um, would like to thank uh, Sherry, uh, as well as uh, the, the rest of the folks who worked on revamping the, the winter sports um, uh, plan for this year. Um, I can tell you that um, the, the boys varsity parents are, are overwhelmingly pleased with the reasonable um, plan that we hope will be put into place um, as it is safe and, and also meets all of the, um, the, the things that we'd hope for in terms of allowing the students to have the feeling of having spectators and, 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 and support in the building. Um, and so I, I just like to to really encourage everybody on the board when you do vote next week to please vote um, yes for this proposed plan. 
Um, the kids are really excited. Um, the parents are excited. I think people in the community will be very happy to know that there will be spectators this year. Um, and, and so I just really want to say thank you um, to everyone who worked on this. Thank you to Sherry for putting together a plan that um, it, it is balanced and, and, and will be very helpful for our, our kids. Um, so it, I, I, I just wanted to express, please, when you vote on the 13th, to please vote yes for this plan. Thanks. Thank you. I also want to um, say thank you to our local legislators who are attending the meeting tonight uh, at the board's invitation. Um, we have a, quite a lot on our agenda, so stay with us. But if any of you would like to say something now would be a fine. There's also time at the end of the meeting. May I just Karen, may I ask a question of Allison? Yes. Well, hi, Allison Clarkson. Uh, I see we have, uh, I'm one of your state senators and we have Alice Nitka and Dick McCormick here as well. I don't see Charlie, but I don't see everybody on the meeting. He is, he is here. Oh, great. Hi, Charlie. Um, <laughs> I would just like to ask if this policy that Sherry's put forward is consistent with the arts audiences as well. When we have music, is this a consistent policy? Because we heard from the Southwest superintendents this morning that one of the frustrations they have is inconsistent policy coming from the agency of Ed. And I'm just wondering if this is consistent. Uh, just to, can I clarify, Sherry, is that okay? Yes. Yes, the policy is all for all co-curricular activities. So just as athletes have four season passes, no. our, that students gonna... can have four invitations to a performance, a music, same thing. So right. it's really, it says winter sports plan, but it is, if you read the depth, it's for co all co-curricular activities. And one of the things we heard loud and clear this morning, and Alice and Dick can chime in uh, <clears throat> if they want to add, but we're all going to be uh, chiming in, we're all going to be emailing the governor's office and the secretary of, a of Ed and his deputy, so Heather, Dan, and Kendall for the governor, uh, to really ask for consistent policy on all Ed fronts, where we heard that really very clearly um, and uh, consistent uh, uh, current testing. And you know, there, my notes are, are here, but they, we are gonna all be taking it upon ourselves as a, as a whole bunch of people were on that call to uh, ask for all the things that we heard uh, heard today, no standardized tests at the end of the year, tests to stay, making that a consistent policy, and we're, uh, and uh, the consistency with, with, with all, with masking, with, with all the, the, the policies that are coming from, from uh, the agency. So I just wanted to say we, and, and if you have anything additional that you'd like us to ask uh, of these three bodies, the governor and the secretaries, uh, please let us know because we would be open, I'd be open to including those in my email anyway, and I'm sure Dick and Alice feel similar. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you. As, as you. As you know, the waiting, I'll, I'll just give you one update because we had a caucus meeting today. The, the, um, the waiting study, which I'm sure many of you are, are waiting for, is uh, having a draft report that you could look on their website uh, you could look on their website on Wednesday, there'll be a draft report and there will be a full report uh, available on Friday. They'll be voting as a committee on uh, that task force will be voting on that this Friday. What so, the full vote not that it goes through the legislative process. No, I am it, uh, it, it gets presented to the legislature as you know, we have a lot on our plate and we only meet for five months a year. So, you know, everything is, so this is certainly one of our top priorities to look at the, the work of the task force, but just wanted to give you an update on where they are and where you can find their work. So Allison, you heard first person speak on each public time and talk about K-95 or K-94s. Yep. Uh, are you going to be speaking to the legislator or to the governor's office about 
you know, I know sometimes people just think they could just wear a scarf or something or a bandana. So are you asking for a specific type of medical approved mask and not just? I, I wasn't planning on it. I was just planning on asking for consistent masking policy, but I am happy to add K95s or better. I think what Allison is noting is that every decision has been left with school board yes. and superintendents. Mm -hmm. And we're all, we're teachers. Yes. We're school leaders. We're, we're not policy you know, drivers in this piece. And so I think what we're, we're all feeling and, and it's everywhere is that we want a consistent message and we want mm -hmm. kids to not sure it's just... and that's what we're all struggling with. Right. And I'm just saying, because I know some people in some places will just put up in water on and that might be accepted and I don't think it should be. I also think that if we do get it that way, we should make the K94 or K95 mask available at the school for those that can't get them or can't afford them. That's all. Yeah. Noted. Thank you. Gary. Yes. I have a comment as a community member that I just, I just it's a good opportunity with the legislators present and a, a fairly large audience that I think it's important you know, to recognize um, the ridiculous amount of strain and effort that the uh, school uh, district employees, all of them from Sherry all the way to everybody at each building has been uh, putting forth for the past two years now um, without with little to no support from the AOE in terms of guidance. And it's just incredibly um, admirable in terms of what they've been doing uh, and continue to do on a daily basis, you know, prioritizing the education of our community and our children and also trying to hear concerns about sports and other, other things. But on a daily basis, what someone like Sherry and school, you know, school building administrators are dealing with through the night and through the weekends is, is extreme. And there's no way that we can really um, clarify that than you continuously as legislators letting you know, the governor and the AOE know what it really looks like in the trenches. And, and for the community to hear that too, because it's, um, I don't know how, if people truly understand the life of an educator looks like these days. Um, but it's the burnout rates are incredibly high, like we're seeing in the healthcare profession too. But it's just, I just want to, you know, it's an opportunity to express my appreciation. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Yeah, thank yes, you. Thank you. Would any of the other legislators like to say a word? You, you have a very long agenda, and Allison has spoken well, so I'll hold my peace. I, I would like to say it's hard to hear the people in the um, conference room to hear everything they're saying, other than Allison, who may be near the speaker. Um, we did in another meeting here today of many, many of the trials and tribulations that the whole school staff is going through in terms of people resigning in terms of um you know the dealing with the in school out of school uh we have a very impressive list which i'm sure you could put together the exact same list of things that are really difficult and how well staff are doing to cope with them so thanks All right, I'm just going to make a comment that there is some background noise. I think some people should probably check to see if they've muted themselves there. Thank you. All right, any other members of the public wish to say anything? Carrie, if I may. Go ahead, Charlie. Thank you. There will be still in the legislative session coming up the same topics that we discussed with the school board last year. And some of that is going to be, is there any aid for school construction? What is the state of public pensions? Um, those are things that we will be discussing again, and there are large issues um, that we will be grappling with. And we'll come back with information to you as those negotiations proceed. And as we know what's coming from the federal government and infrastructure money too. So we have to think about, uh, is there money for school construction in there? Yes, no. How much, how will it be divvied out? Well, anyway, so I just want to say that it's, it is very much concerned uh, about the health and welfare of our teachers and staff, uh, absolutely. And yeoman service has been given. 
but we just want to make sure that the other stuff that is not nearly as, well, nearly as of primary interest right now, or certainly in the headlines, is, is going to be uh, fought, <laughs> uh, discussed, and hopefully uh, resolved. Thank you. All right, is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? If not, then we can move right into the report, starting with the superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many of you here. It's, it's really important. Um, if you look at the board book, <clears throat> there's an overview of my report. I'm just going to hit some of the high points. And it highlights the number of students that are vaccinated in each of our schools, a high school being the highest with over 80%, Woodstock Elementary with close to 70%, and our other elementary schools ranging between 40 and 30%. This was written a week ago, and I just wanna update you on Thursday, we had the highest rate of COVID activity, number of positive students that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic. Over the weekend, we had the highest rate over the weekend with seven additional students. We as a district really have not been hit as hard as other districts, we are now pulling, feeling the full weight of the pandemic and in terms of our experience and had additional students found positive today. I wanna to thank again, Katie Burke has done an amazing job. Each of our principals, not only are they serving in the leadership position, many have been substitute teachers, custodians, school nurses are now doing test to stay protocols in order to keep our buildings and schools open. So just as Adam and others have said, thank you. I just want people to understand what it's taking to keep our schools open and our students in school every day. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and was asked to talk about how we've used the federal dollars that have been given to us and who we greatly appreciate. Again, what we've seen so far are the COVID relief funds, ESSER 1 and ESSER 2, um, ESSER 3 or ARP, ESSER has not been available yet. And so here's a quick list of how we've used those resources. Um, we have greatly improved our technology capacity in all of our schools. We're now moving into wiring in all our buildings and RAP can talk much more specifically. These are huge pieces that have taken these kinds of funds to make happen. We were able to offer our summer program, Summer Soap for free to all students. We were able to purchase new furniture for all of our schools so that we have furniture that can move. Uh, a year and a half ago in the summertime, we didn't have enough desks so that we could have everybody in the classroom and social distance. We now have furniture that we can be proud of and our students can be proud of and can move based upon our need. We have um, updated our, our outdoor learning spaces at all our campuses. We've had been able to develop a stronger teacher mentoring program for offering tutoring to students after school and teachers are being paid per diem, first time ever. Um, we have a new district team, we have some new district team members who are looking at our equity issues, as well as making sure we're using data in, the, in a way that improves student outcomes. Um, we are having much more deeper professional development, focusing on universal design for learning, meaning every student has a way to access what's in the classroom, as well as developing our equity understanding and skills. Um, I'm now preparing the uh, ARP ESSER, ESSER 3 grants, um, and we will follow similar goals as I've outlined here. Um, what's important to note as well is that as Alice was note, I, I, Allison was noting, in terms of the pupil waiting factors, for us to know, and it's new from what was originally proposed, we are a benefactor of the new waiting system as been modeled. There's a link in the board book um, in my report that shows the modeling and the positive impact that would be in place for our district with this new uh, form of waiting. So I think that's important to note and something we want to support. In our equity work, we did a day long training on November 8th with Dr. Lavelle Brown, who is the superintendent from Ithaca, New York. Um, we were able to look at how we are, um, what our equity efforts are, looking at our culture. Also, Carrie and Rice spoke to the entire faculty and, and uh, staff, thanking them for their work and effort. And Bryce, of course, brought the cupcakes from King Arthur, which were amazing, <laughs> and were gone by lunchtime. Um, 
Another piece of work that I'm proud of, uh, for years we've been trying to put into place a teacher's institute, and it's part of our strategic plan. This is an opportunity where our teachers are offering graduate level coursework for, especially for different endorsements. Um, this spring, we will be offering uh, coursework that will lead to a special education uh, endorsement. Myself, Gina Roth, and Julie Brown will be offering two graduate level courses on the weekend so that we can begin that. Our hope is that in the future, we'll offer other graduate works so we will become a center and resource for teacher professional development beyond our own educators and paraeducators. So that's the superintendent's report. Thank you so much. I have one question. After the percentage in the superintendent's report, the next paragraph, it says after middle and high schools, more than 80% of yep. our students were fully vaccinated. Yes. And it skips down and says that when there is a COVID exposure yes. in the building, we're able to continue school with classes in the building and not have to require students to quarantine. Correct. The child or the person that's showing that their test is positive. If they're, they're not quarantined, that's what that means. Right. If they are asymptomatic and positive, they can come to school because we're at 80%. Once you hit that 8% benchmark, and that's why we're able to keep the school. If you are symptomatic and COVID positive, you must quarantine. I'm just okay. asking yeah. for clarification no, uh, before it goes to from a draft to a, a minute the next time. Thank you, Jim. All right. That's, that's important. All. That's all. And what we all decide. Then someone will say, no, this is what you said. Right. And what you need to know, none of us as administrators answer any COVID questions, only Katie Burke. So Katie Burke has been monitoring a COVID-19 quarter. The situation, regulations are changing daily. Expectations are changing daily. Um, the other thing I forgot to say is that one of the tools we are using is this test to stay. The challenge is supply. We don't know if we're going to have enough beyond tomorrow. Good, good to know. Test to stay. And the other part of it is that we don't have enough school nurses and we've posted position for six weeks now to do all the, so teachers and principals have been trained on how to do tests to stay. If we start getting COVID positive teachers, we won't be able to keep this process working. Mm -hmm. So it is a house of cards that we are holding on to, but I will tell you it's very tenuous. Keeping school open has become an incredible challenge. And as Adam said, it's 24 seven, there are no weekends. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, next is the Director of Technology and Innovation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Raphael Adamek, and I'll just give you two quick updates um, on our technology work. Uh, so Sherry mentioned some of our ESSER funding, um, and, and I just wanted to tell you about a couple of projects that we've done. Um, this past summer, we used ESSER funds to do significant rewiring projects in both the middle school, high school building and at the Prosper Valley School. Um, we've started a process of, of looking at all of our other buildings. Um, and so we're, we're, we're planning to put out requests for proposals to, to have um, wiring projects done at each of our other buildings in order to get us up to the same standard. Um, so that's a big part of the technology work that we're embarking on to build a solid foundation with which we can then um, layer on our other technology work on top of that. Um, and the second piece I just wanted to mention was um, we're very excited to be rolling out a new tool for our students in the next month. Um, this is a tool called Learning Ally with um, 80,000 audio books that will be available to our struggling readers throughout the district. Um, and this is a tool that is really in line with a lot of our Universal Design for Learning UDL work that we've been doing um, and will be made, will be made available to students um, K through 12. And, and we hope that this will increase access um, to, to, to audiobooks throughout the entire district. Thank you, Raf. Any questions for Raf? All this right. Very I'm very excited about that. All right, uh, next up is our Director of Student Support Services. Hi, I'm Gina Rock. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. We have a lot going on in our Department of Student Services um, for student supports. 
Um, on the front of multi-tiered systems of support, we have added um, more resources and tools uh, for teachers on our dashboard. Um, we've um, refined the process for speech and language and motor concerns, and that's all on the dashboard. And then in the spirit of UDL, we've created multiple pathways for accessing the forms. So there are different ways that teachers can go about utilizing these and we are keep refining them because this is all a work in progress, which is something that I actually want to highlight. I wanna thank all of the, um, from teachers, general education teachers to special education teachers and interventionists for all the work that we're doing related to tiered support for students. Um, this process and you know, our, our benchmarks for ourselves, I think we you know, want to always be ahead of the game. And I just wanted to, I told them when I met with building based teams, be thankful and appreciate that you're doing great work with students. And if our systems and our forms need to continue to be revising, if we need to figure out how we're gathering our data and how we're analyzing and where's the hub for that, those pieces are fine. We focus on the work that we're doing with students. And so I just wanna say thank you to, for all that hard work because um, students need it and we appreciate everything that they're doing. We are focusing on building base levels now where we're meeting with the interventionists, principals, and um, educational support team building base leaders to refine this process and continue our work. Our late start um, with Katie Novak on November 3rd, um, we got positive feedback mm -hmm. on allowing the first 30 minutes, we created a choice board for teachers to choose what they needed to do for themselves to prepare for Katie to come. And some of that was just connection and discussion with colleagues. Uh, and that's a common theme that you'll probably hear uh, most educators say that there's not enough time to do all the things. And part of that is how do we work with our, our colleagues? How do we plan and reflect and digest the information? Um, we also are, as Sherry mentioned, using the after school learning program, um, the tutoring program of using our teachers to help support some of the tiered supports that students need as well. Um, in terms of some of our equity and inclusion work, we um, completed our district self-assessment team protocol that Dr. Katie Novak will um, be able to provide us feedback specific to our district and our systems and make recommendations and suggestions for where to go to continue with our work on effective MTSS. Um, in special education, we had our ARP IDEA grant submitted and the focus of that um, is to really increase our capacity for transportation for students with special needs, as well as decrease our costs around that. Um, and finally, we did our annual um, compliance related to adverse effect training um, that the AOE requires and I am deep into all the compliance activities that the AOE um, requires submission by January 15th. Thank you for your time tonight and I'll pass it over to Jen. Thanks, Gina. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Stainton. I'm Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Um, and I'm gonna start with a professional learning update. Uh, we are in the midst of the second round of teachers signing up for credit bearing professional learning. So as of this week, we've had over 80 courses accessed by our teachers, totaling over 195 hours worth of learning, which is exceptional. Uh, the fall offering of Julie Brown's Literacy and Justice for All course just finished with 13 district teachers having an awareness of our shift in literacy education towards the science of reading. Uh, just today, a spring offering of the course was released and actually we encourage board members to sign up. So please reach out to me if you're interested in taking this course. Uh, the Mathematics Equity Group is spending this month in each school gathering feedback from teachers on a draft mission and vision for mathematics in our district. And this group will be presenting their work to the board next month, so stay tuned. Uh, finally, teachers are gearing up for our local winter assessment window, which is vital for helping us meet the learning needs of individual students in our schools. The window opened today and will go through late January. As a reminder, our district's assessment calendar is located on our SU website in the parent portal. And a thanks go out to all teachers for making this happen. And that's it for me. Thank you. I think Jim's next. Yes, he is. So in the finance world, uh, we finished the field work for our audits and the auditors were here and did field work for the SU, for the 
unified district and for Pittsfield. They'll return next week to do what's called federally mandated single audit, act audit, which um, is also known as the A133 um, audit, which is required because we get more than half a million dollars. I think it's a threshold $750,000 of federal funds now. Um, Finance committee has been working hard on the budget and later on in the agenda, uh, Ben and I will be presenting uh, a budget draft for you. Um, we also later on in the agenda will be presenting a recommendation for announced tuition rates. Um, the recommended increase is based on a March to March increase in the consumer price index. And um, so we wanted to base on something that we could reach out and touch and it wasn't something that we did just randomly and arbitrarily. Um, I also included um, a link, I believe, um, a separate document with the year to date for October 31st spending. And uh, although I've been away for a couple of days, I haven't heard it from anybody. So I'm assuming uh, you didn't have any questions, but please, if you have questions, reach out to me. Uh, moving forward, our projects on our horizon is uh, Joe and I will begin to develop a five year capital improvements plan for the district. Um, we're continuing to explore migrating to the state recommended e finance software platform for next year. And we'll begin to migrate our accounts payable process to a more automated process. One of the first steps there is to begin moving many of our vendors from paper checks to ACH payments. And we started that this week uh, by putting a half dozen of our major vendors on ACH. And we'll be adding vendors every week and moving away from uh, paper documents and paper checks. And that's it. I have one question for Raph. If we can go back, Raph, can you go back to the enrollment um, screen? And the, underneath the percentages, there's a tuition funding source equals operating school district. That 949 is as of 1129, I think. What was the number that really matters, Raph, and where will we see that? Because what is it? It's it's the first 10 days of whatever. Go through that again. But the 949 is as of 1129. We were well past the actual count, correct? Yes. So, so the ADM period um, is the 10th through the 30th day of school. And so that's when um, we submit our reports to the state and, and all the average daily membership is calculated. Um, and so the numbers that you see in these reports are, are a little bit lower than what we would actually have in our officially submitted reports because we have students attending uh, private pre-Ks as well. Um, so, so we should be getting those official um, numbers back from the state, hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, to, to get the actual ADM. So when we have another report later on and going in the future years, can we just have an ADM number line also that when we have it, so then finance will know what numbers they're working off of? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the goal is, you know, we want to get the official numbers back from the state. We can we can predict them and we sort of have put a lot of systems in place to make sure that they're they're accurate. But um, until we get those official numbers back, we, we don't really know where we stand with them. But yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right, and the last report is from the Director of Buildings and Grounds. And I don't think Joe is here, but he did provide a letter. Joe's here. I, no, I can here. give you a quick update. So uh, we finalized our contract with uh, Johnson Controls and we're gonna be starting some of the energy efficiency projects here. Uh, probably the third week of December, we're going to be starting at the high school. Uh, they'll be coming in second shift and we're going to be uh, starting with uh, LED lights. We'll be changing out all our fluorescent bulbs to LEDs at the high school and then we'll be making our way throughout the rest of the district. Um, we'll hit the ground running most likely here in the summertime to do a lot of the larger projects, the solar on the roofs, replacing some roofs, things like that. Um, we've also uh, in the process here of finishing up our uh, HVAC work, changing out boilers from oil to propane at Barnard Academy and at Prosper Valley. I hope to have Prosper Valley finished 
by the end of this week, uh, there was a delay in the boilers. They were uh, waiting off the coast of California <laughs> along with everything else. But it looks like uh, we're at the final stretch here. And as Jim indicated uh, in the near future here, we're going to be exploring uh, our five-year capital improvement plans and uh, looking into ESSER funding, um, how we can spend it and how we can use it on our buildings. And just to tag on to uh, Sherry's report, we did use about $400,000 worth of ESSER money to improve the HVAC systems in the school, uh, multiple schools here last year. And that's about all I have. All right, any questions? All right, I'd like to ask if there is a student report tonight. <laughs> so Owen is here. I'm also here. Yep. Um, I don't have much to report. I am interested in talking a little bit about uh, things to do with the money that we're going to be receiving. Um, but I don't know when the best time to do that is and if that's now. Um, I'm also wondering about what happens if we do need to go back to hybrid learning, if we're going to go back to something similar to last year, or if we're just going to try to stay open indefinitely. Um, I also heard from a bunch of my fellow students, I think some of them were supposed to be here, talking about um, having spectators for winter sports. I don't really know what the status of that is for like hockey and stuff, but I know there were some petitions being signed. Um, again, those are just some questions I have. I don't really have anything else to add. Alrighty. Um, hi everyone, I'm Owen. I also am gonna try to keep this pretty brief, but I did take it upon myself to briefly pick the collective brains of the ninth grade um, after Ms. Sousa was so kind to meet with me on Friday. Uh, apparently, uh, after asking them, I, I was told this was going to be a pretty budget-heavy meeting, so I was asking them where they think funding should be better allotted um, in the school and uh, in, the, in the district as a whole. Uh, but their thoughts were, and this is just kind of raw, unfiltered, data, um, but their thoughts were some utilities and renovations things like the bathrooms, although that's probably not a board thing, um, and COVID testing uh, to improve that. I recognize there's obvious difficulties in improving COVID testing when we don't have supply to maintain it as it is, but you know, just thoughts. Uh, and also special education funding. So those seem to be the three things that people cared the most about. Um, but overall, I think we're doing pretty well on the, the high school front. Thank you, Owen. Aiden is here as well, I believe. Um, yep, uh, my name is Aiden, and I don't really have any reports, um, but I do want to add on to what Jen and people were saying about the um, sports petitions. Uh, I've been seeing those around the school. I haven't been in the school recently due to an ankle injury, but I have um, been seeing it online and I would just kind of like get an uh, understanding of where we are now with um, like different sports guidelines and uh, sports like audience. And I know we were discussing um, uh, the uh, COVID cases recently and I don't know if that might jeopardize the um, chances we might have to bring back audiences to winter sports. Can I respond, Carrie? Sure. Um, Genevieve and Aiden and Owen, thank you for bringing my, my attention. So on Friday, an email was sent out to parents regarding a new winter sport plan. And I can see from your feedback that now it needs to go to our students. So I take responsibility for that. Genevieve, I would love to hear any input in terms of the ESSER money. I know we're meeting Wednesday morning at 7 Five. We can talk some more. So if you have some ideas with that piece, and and thank you all for going and talking to your 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 colleague students around the concerns and interests around how we use our resources. So after the budget um, presentation today, if there's any other feedback that you want us to have, please email me or the board, and we welcome that feedback. 
Sorry, did you want to just give them a quick before person? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure it goes out to the students. That's really good feedback from the, our team. All right, thank you very much, students. We appreciate it. Carrie, you. I just, Carrie, I've just got one quick question about the sports thing. Did, did I miss an email going out to the board about that? The email went out to parents. It did not go out to the board, but I okay. can um, send, send it out as well. I apologize. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. Sure. All right. I think uh, then the next thing on our agenda is to accept a retirement. Um, and I think Maggie is probably going to speak about that. Sure, so um, sadly, uh, happily for her, I think, but sadly for us, um, Peggy Ogilvie, who has been a music teacher at Woodstock Elementary for 16 years and just started um, teaching at Rest at Reading Elementary as well this year, uh, will be retiring at the end of this school year. I've known Peggy for seven of those um, 16 years. I've worked with her here at West and She's a cornerstone of so many of our school traditions from leading songs at our assemblies, um, the Maypole uh, celebration every year on our playground with the Maypole dance and the sword dance. Um, she uh, is known for our holiday concerts. She's collaborated with other music teachers to bring the band oh. showcase to the district. Um, and she's just such a collaborative partner to any teacher or her unified arts team to bring new ideas to the classroom and um, partner with anything that anyone wants help with. She's, she's so eager um, and, and she is the highlight of so many students weekly experiences at West and at rest with the um, music classes she teaches, the songs she teaches, the dances she teaches, um, the movement activities, um, introducing students to their um, beginner band lessons, teaching the recorder in third grade, um, and the choral program that she also ran at West for many years. So she's been such an instrumental, no pun intended, part of West and in our district community at large. And, and she will be missed, but it's a well-earned um, retirement for sure. I make a motion to accept the resignation. A second. If there's any say no, you can say it now. Okay, we accept her resignation with regret, I believe. As well, we have um, two board resignations. We've received letters from both uh, Louis Picconi and Claire Drabitko, two um, longer serving folks who worked through some of the roughest patches of the merger and um, Lou on policy and Claire on policy as well. And they've served uh, the Woodstock community as the representatives extremely well. And we, uh, we will miss them uh, as they are going to step off the board as of um, December 31. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't believe we do need to vote as Jim pointed out but we can make a motion to accept their resignations. Thanks guys for your service. Appreciate it. You're here. All right. So any Woodstock folks on this call, the, the seats are open and you can uh, go to the town clerk and find out what you need to do in order to get on the ballot for, well, to be appointed now, but also to, to run again in March. So thank you. Thank you both really um, for all the work that you've done. And Claire, Claire is right after this meeting, not the 31st. Okay. Right. Sorry. I'm, I'm trying to use my phone as my guide here. <laughs> very small print. All right, we are going to hear now um, a presentation from Maggie and Aaron um, on stewardship strategy. Sure. Rena, do I have the ability to share my screen? Oh. 
Yeah, you should be all set, Maggie. Okay, thank you. All right. Maggie, can you turn your volume up? We can turn it up. Oh, for my, oh, okay. We got you. Is that showing the WCSU stewardship survey results? Yes. yes. Perfect. So um, Principal Aaron Sinkamani from Prosper Valley School and I are here um, to talk with you about some work we're doing with a great committee of teachers um, towards one of the goals in the strategic plan. And we wanna acknowledge this group of teachers that's giving their time to help with this work this year. So we have Marsha Govin from the elementary STEM team. We have Lisa Kaya, who's an elementary art teacher. We have Sammy DeCola, who's a high school environmental science teacher. We have Rob Hansen, who's a sixth grade teacher at Prosper Valley. Jenny Hewitt, who teaches fourth and fifth grade at Barnard Academy. Kate Kardashian, middle school, high school special educator. Janice Babel, who is the high school horticulture and agriculture teacher and Sarah Pena, who is an elementary art teacher. So we are really um, glad to have representation across several different schools and, and um, subject areas to assist with this work. Thank you, Ms. Mills and I, with the support of the WCSU stewardship team just mentioned, have begun uh, to explore strategic plan goal 1.4, uh, which as you can see is to review, refine, and where necessary, establish stewardship experiences so that they are well-planned, purposeful, and integrated into content areas in grade level curriculum. Great. So this area of the strategic plan links right back to the portrait of a graduate. And as you know, stewardship is one of the um, five areas of the portrait. And we just wanted to kind of orient you to the definition of stewardship as given by the portrait of a graduate. So in the portrait, uh, stewardship has to do with um, taking responsibility for the local and global community, civic responsibility, um, personal wellness and community health and wellness, embracing diversity, respecting differences and acting with empathy and care for others. Uh, aligned with the strategic plan goal 1.4 uh, outlined here, we have step one, which is what we've accomplished so far. Uh, we've had 52 responses across the district. Uh, step two is what we uh, we'll be focusing on next uh, in uh, mid to late January with the stewardship team uh, just mentioned. And the following slides will just take an opportunity to share the preliminary data that we've gathered so far again. And then in uh, mid to late January, we'll be getting together as a larger team to review that data more thoroughly. And then we hope to be able to come back to the board uh, with some uh, potential future planning ideas. So our first question was, where do folks work that are answering the survey? And again, we had good distribution across the different campuses, uh, more responses, of course, from West and the middle school, high school, where there are more staff. But I'm glad to see that we had representation from all the schools um, responding. And of uh, the 52 responses and the representation uh, that participated in the survey, as you can see, just about 57 to 58 percent of the respondents are classroom teachers. Uh, followed by unified arts teachers, and then uh, our school counselors and special educators. So we wanted to make sure that we're getting representation, not just across um, the campuses and the different roles that people play, but also representation um, from the various amount of time that, that people have been in the district. We wanted to know, um, are the opportunities being provided by both teachers and staff who are new to the district, as well as those who have been well-established here. So. Um, more of the respondents were here for a greater amount of time, almost 70% were, uh, have been in the district for six or more years, but we did get representation from those that have been in the district for less time as well. And nearly 80% of those that participated in this survey indicate being a part of a stewardship experience with students as defined in the portrait of graduate. We also were interested to know um, what's the frequency with which these experiences are happening. We know that sometimes teachers plan an annual event that goes with one part of their curriculum and at other times 
um, they have an ongoing project or they have a weekly experience that happens in their classroom. So we wanted to get a better understanding of whether stewardship tends to be something students are experiencing um, once a year or it's something that they have exposure to throughout the curriculum. So we were encouraged to see that um, stewardship isn't just an annual event, but something that happens in various types of um, kind of patterns and flows throughout the school year. We also wanted to know if the staff responding to the survey could sort of self-identify the links between the types of stewardship experiences they provide and the, the definitions of stewardship as provided by the portrait of graduates. So we asked them to think about the, um, a specific stewardship experience that they offer to students and um, indicate which of the uh, parts of the portrait of a graduate it aligned with. So, um, you can see that it's very common for uh, stewardship experiences to align to taking responsibility for local and global communities, which is sort of a broader concept. And um, there were some other examples of stewardship that, that were more specific, like caring for the elderly or developing a sense of community. Um, but lots of the experiences hit on multiple aspects of the, of the portrait of a graduate, which is also encouraging to see. And uh, thanks to Kathleen Robbins' original review of this preliminary data, here are just a few takeaways. Uh, it is encouraging to see there is a wide range of stewardship experiences, excuse me, across Windsor Central Supervisory Union. Uh, and definitions of stewardship and the diversity of those experiences across the district will require uh, further analysis as we work to more clearly define stewardship in our district uh, per uh, the strategic plan goal 1.4. Any questions for uh, Maggie and Aaron? Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, the All next right. we're going to do Take a look at the school calendar and approve it. So you will see a draft calendar in front of you. Um, what is unique about this calendar is how closely I've worked with superintendents and other districts in the region um, to make sure that our, our calendars are aligned. Um, this is helpful in that many of our parents live in other districts and their children are, are attending different schools, as well as making sure that we're aligned closer uh, to Hartford Area Tech Center. Um, this year, uh, Tech Center started much earlier than we did, and so Tom DeBalzi has been a great partner in getting us more closely aligned. So our students who attend the Hartford Tech Center really are within the same schedule as uh, the other you know, students who are not attending. Um, you'll also say, I'll bring to your attention that we've added Indigenous Peoples Day in October. Um, it was noted, especially this year, that that was a long period of time to go from Labor Day to um, Veterans Day. And with Veterans Day really being kind of respite from parent-teacher conferences, um, not only did it give us an opportunity to respect the day at Indigenous Peoples Day, but also to make sure that we had a, a short break uh, in the October period. Um, you'll see some changing in terms of February vacation is about, it looks like a week later. Again, that's to align with other districts while the April break is pretty consistent with what we've had. And we are also continuing to ask for our late start days. Those two hours of professional development have really been a pivotal opportunity to move some of our work forward without adding uh, additional responsibilities onto our teachers. So those are the highlights of the new calendar. Motion to approve the 22-23 school year calendar. Seconded. I have a yeah. question, sir. Are the two hour delays the same amount as we have had this, this yes. year? Yes, it's totally in line with our current model. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Move the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Can I make a comment? That is the fastest that we've ever approved a calendar in my 20 <laughs> years of being in the district. So uh, thank you. You took care of all the other issues the other years. Oh my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> I am blown. Thank you for adding Indigenous people. You're welcome. That was, um, that, you were right. It was a long time. 
space is not possible for it. Oh, because it's a space. Two years, right? Yeah. Well, I'm getting a lot of that. The state was passed in us. Well, we, it we, was we passed or that we did that. <laughs> one thing we could get credit for. But um, one thing we someday will hopefully have is a unified state calendar. So, yeah, the, other, the other piece of work is that making sure that our calendar is respective of all cultures. Um, you know, this is definitely uh, one that's a very traditional kind of model in terms of scheduling. And so, one of the pieces of work that Jen Staten brought to my attention is to review this calendar with a much more open view in terms of how we establish what are our priority days for vacation and making sure that. The calendar is respectable of all cultures, and that's a piece of work that we we need to do. We haven't been able to do it this year. Uh, you're driving the conversation on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you, board. All right. Uh, now, uh, uh, Jim Fenn and Ben Ford are going to present the uh, tuition rate for fiscal year 23. Hey, Jim, if it's all right, I'd like to uh, tee this up. He's okay. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, the next couple of topics on on the agenda are the um, are the uh, finance topics that uh, our student representatives said that this meeting would be uh, kind of heavily balanced or heavily weighted towards. This first one is going to be a little bit of a, of a, a dip of a toe into finance topics. Uh, relatively early in the process of decision making for finance each year, we need to set the tuition rates. And board members who were around um, last year may recall that we spent quite a bit of time on this one actually in the, the budget process because it got a little bit contentious on the elementary school rates. And one of the things that we struggled with as a board and as a finance committee is that we really haven't had um, much of, a, uh, of an approach for determining tuition rates. We've looked around other school districts. We've kind of looked at, um, you know, are, are there, you know, where does it fit in the, in the overall budget? Um, but uh, this year, uh, kind of backing up to last year, we didn't change the tuition rates last year. And um, as a result, uh, you know, we feel that this year we're probably in a position where we, we can move them. Well, how much though, right? Um, we're, I'm about ready to drown everybody here with a ton of details on how Vermont uh, finance works. But I think the thing that we can, you're going to see emerge from a lot of details is that generally there's like a cost of living that increases. There's inflationary factors and in that every year, um, you know, dollars kind of move uh, upward, right? Um, so to capture that, our finance director this year came up with a very elegant and simple solution that the finance committee thought was great. And that was uh, essentially to uh, peg our tuition rates to the consumer price index. And I guess, Jim, would you like to elaborate kind of on your thinking there? Sure. The consumer price index is a national measure of what, uh, how prices have increased over a year. And it, although it's totally unrelated to how our cost of operation, it's a national index that anybody can look at. Um, here we have a couple of things that are driven by a March to March um, index comparison. So we said, let's do the tuition the same way so that we're tying all of our indexes together to the same factors. And this year we did. Um, the March to March increase was 2.6 something percent. And we went with that. We rounded up to the nearest $5 and came up with the, uh, the values that you see in the uh, board book. I'm going to make a motion to set the FY23 announced tuition rate elementary at 16425 high school at 18985 Anyone second it? Second. Discussion? Questions? Not hearing any, I'll call a question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jim, yeah. do, you, uh, do you have, just because I'm not um, going to do the math as fast as you, maybe probably the, the exact numbers that it was before the rates? This, and, this, this year is 16,000 elementary. Okay. And 18,500 at the high school. Got it. Thank you. I'll still follow the question. All those in favor of 
uh, proving these tuition rates? Please say aye. 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 All right. And then uh, now we can sit back while you take us through the, the budget presentation. Yeah. Uh, so this next one um, hopefully will be a little quicker than maybe anybody here would have feared. Recognizing that we've got a lot of new board members who weren't part of the process this year, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to just take um, maybe five to 10 minutes to do an overview. Um, hold on, let me share my screen so that we can see this uh, presentation deck I've got here. Um, five or 10 minutes to, um, to um, kind of go over some of the, can everybody see my, my, uh, my, my screen? Okay, to do some ABCs, right? Um, how, how does uh, education finance uh, in Vermont work? I think a lot of board members are here, um, you know, very closely attuned to the tax rates. And we're gonna show you tonight um, really how those get calculated and, and what we're looking at for FY23. Um, that is the, the, the next uh, budget year that we're, that we're in the middle of uh, planning. Um, we're gonna take a look at some of the, the, um, the factors and the things we have to make assumptions about, kind of the big ticket items in our budget uh, and what we know about them at this point. And then uh, we're gonna talk about some of the things that we see as uh, meaningful as a board and as a, uh, an administration that we could potentially choose to spend money on differently than we, we spent last year. Um, things to add into the budget to affect some outcomes. Really? Um, the next thing we'll, we'll look at is some, some forecasts uh, to say, okay, based on some assumptions that we've made here, let's look at some ranges in terms of how these numbers could land. And then we're gonna uh, come down to, based on all the information that we have right now, what, is the, what are the tax rates looking like um, you know, as of today's date? And then uh, the last thing we'll see is the, the next steps for the budget vote. Now, um, before we jump into this, um, I guess what I, I, I want to first say that this, this tends to be pretty dry. So feel free to interrupt me if you've got a question on uh, some, of these, some of these topics to say, that eh, doesn't make any sense to me. And I'll do my best to, to kind of break it down so that we can all have our, uh, our heads around it and, and go in with a common level of understanding before we, uh, we make decisions. Um, I guess contrary to what the, the agenda says tonight, we're not going to take any, any votes other than what we've already voted on for the tuition. Last year, our, our final uh, budget vote was around January 4, and there's just a lot of pieces that we don't have in place yet in terms of knowing uh, what those um, kind of big key factor numbers are uh, to be able to, to make a final budget vote. So uh, with no further ado, I'm, I'm hoping that to keep this presentation to about 10, 15 minutes so that nobody goes to, to sleep on us. But uh, let's take a look at some of these basic concepts. And a lot of these are, are terms that are defined in uh, Vermont law, right? And that's how we, 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 that's why we're using these words that, some, uh, these phrases that some of them are kind of a mouthful. So education spending is a, is a big um, uh, concept, right? And that's essentially um, what you need to raise from the taxpayers. You take your budget each year, and uh, Jim Fenn, our, our finance director, has already you know, created our budget. We have a, a good idea of what it is that we uh, are looking to spend for FY23. And then there are some revenue sources that uh, come out of that that you don't have to raise from the taxpayers, grant funding, things like um, those tuition uh, amounts that we, we get from the you know, approximately 100 or so kids who, who um, you know, choose our town uh, to go to school. That's not money that we have to collect from the taxpayers because there's another you know town outside of our district who's who's paying those tuition amounts and it and it reduces the amount that we have to collect from our taxpayers. Um, but there's a number of things that go into those revenue amounts. But education spending, just to keep in mind, that's what we have to raise from our taxpayers uh, for voters in the district. You take that education spending number and you divide it by the number of equalized pupils you have. Now, what's an equalized pupil? Essentially, the, the state says not every student uh, counts the same. Your preschoolers count about 0 0.5, 0 0.46. Um, your uh, English as a second language students uh, count for, for more than one, right? Uh, essentially, it gets a little bit more expensive to educate a kid the further along they go in the process. So there's a formula that, the, uh, that uh, RAF on our staff uh, works with Jim to, to execute, 
and we've got a pretty good idea of how many uh, equalized pupils we have for budgetary purposes at this point, but we won't have the final number probably for another couple of weeks, like Raf had indicated. But you take that education spending, you divide it by how many equalized pupils you have, and that uh, you get your per pupil spend. Per pupil spend is an important number because the state says you have you, you you're limited in it. There's consequences if you go over it. Um, but if you if you um, take that per pupil spend, divide it by what we call the, the yield amount, that gets your tax rate. And then uh, what I'd said uh, earlier about uh, the per pupil spend, there is a threshold that the state says you need to stay under and they publish that each year. And if you go over it, you're into penalty phase. Now, one of the interesting things about the pandemic and what it's brought, and there's a lot, there's a lot of volatility, is that uh, last year and this year, the state has essentially said that they're not imposing uh, any any uh, penalties for penalty phase. Um, we looked at that as a finance committee as we were kind of looking at uh, you know spending decisions this year, and we said, okay, that's all well and good, but since our greatest uh, costs are really around staff, we wouldn't want to make decisions that you know put us into penalty phase in any other year because next year we'll probably have the same staff, and when they take that uh, restriction off, then we may find ourselves in, in trouble that we can't get ourselves out of. Um, the yield is, is pretty, a pretty significant concept. Um, as most on the call uh, probably know, certainly our, our, uh, our leadership from the, the legislature, um, the, uh, the, the state of Vermont is it's not unique, but it's one of very few states that pools taxes, education taxes, in order to create an education fund and then um, redistributes those funds based on essentially how many kids um, a, a school district has, right, based on those local budgets that, that we get voted on by our taxpayers. Um, the yield amount takes a look at, at what the, uh, the, the commissioner of taxes on December 1st of every year takes a look at, you know, what's in the state education fund and then says, okay, what do we need to raise and kind of what are uh, uh, projections looking like? And they come up with a number just to fit into this formula. And uh, I'll give you guys an update on that because that letter uh, did come out this week. Okay, so, uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about in terms of um, the, uh, some of these ABCs is the, the, the CLA, that's the common level of appraisal. And again, what the state um, does each year is it looks at property values and says, based on um, local real estate um, you know, fluctuations in the market, they do an assessment and it's essentially, it takes the place of, of an appraisal uh, that would be done or otherwise at the municipal level. And it's just a, a factor that gets put on um, you know, any given town's um, real estate values so that uh, the tax rate for any specific town is gonna be different from the equalized tax rate, which is um, what we come up with before that, that uh, real estate uh, factoring gets applied. So the upshot of that is that Every town in the school district, even though we're we're all paying for the same budget, your local real estate um, economy is going to influence the tax rate significantly, and we'll we'll show you that as well. Uh, those are the ABCs. Uh, I want to pause right there and see if there are any questions, particularly from any of our newer board members. Okay, looks like it's as, as clear as <laughs> Sorry, Jim. When are you going to give it to the old ones? You said the new ones. <laughs> I'm going to throw my skill in here once again. This board has no control over each individual town CLA. We're here to build a budget for the school. And just like last year with Killington with Jennifer, when she was on the board of myself, we had an issue. We voted no at the first point because of the increase on the initial. We were never looking at the CLA because you cannot control the CLA. That is done by how houses are bought in your town. We're building a budget. Don't be afraid of the CLA. Thanks, Jim. Uh, anybody else have questions on kind of how all this stuff uh, works, fits together? Okay, well, let's keep going. Oh, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, first of all, as an idiot, this is fascinating and amazing, and thank you for providing this for new board members and old alike. Um, could, is this something you can send to us after as well? I didn't notice in the board docs because – I'd like to go over it again and not take time, but this is this is great for someone who's terrible sure. at that. Yeah, yeah. I'll send this to Raina so it'll be in the minutes. So everybody Thank can you. have it. Thank you have so it. much. Sure thing. 
Anybody else? And I'm presenting. I can't see if, if, if you got questions. So just go ahead and speak up. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so this next slide is going to be the one that's got the most information on it in terms of what we've learned so far in the budget process. These are essentially the things that, and you're going to see in a minute, um, a, a, a detailed view of, of our kind of budget worksheet. Um, but these are the factors. I'm going to walk through these six things that are going to have the greatest influence over the budget. And the first one is our audit results. Um, your, our auditors come in and uh, they, they look at the, um, to, uh, the year prior, right? So we're currently in uh, FY22, um, and uh, the auditors are taking a look at the completed FY21, and they've uh, determined uh, that we're somewhere in the vicinity of a very large surplus, at least uh, from, from historical uh, surpluses that we or or deficits that we've seen. 350k is 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 a nice amount, and essentially, um, you know, I guess Jim was a little bit underwhelmed by that when we we saw it um, this week, uh, saying, "Hey, it looks like you spent most of your budget. That's pretty good," but. Um, for those like uh, Jim Half, who've, who've been on the finance committee with me in, in uh, years past, we've um, we've kind of been sweating some some major deficits. So to be on this side of the ledger is pretty great. Um, the next thing uh, is enrollment. Um, we've taken kind of a conservative um, approach. We really don't want to get surprised by the AOE, but even with that approach, we're seeing an increase uh, up from 928 last year to 932. This is a calculation. You never know what that final number is going to be until you get it. We're going to have to wait a couple weeks. But again, if um, you're going to see that that your per pupil spend number is somewhere in the $19,000 range. So you can multiply that by each uh, number of new uh, equalized pupils that we get. That's nice. That's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of another 100K that we, we didn't have last year based on people you know, moving to our district. Um, Health insurance, uh, this is something that only goes up and it has had uh, a tendency to really bite us. In years past, we've seen health insurance cost increases uh, of 12 and 15% some years. This year, uh, a lot better than that. We're, we're looking at um, you know, only a 5% increase and that's, um, that's as low as I, I think any of us have, have ever seen it. Uh, what's that due to? That's it's a statewide um, negotiated um, you know, these plans. Um, it's because um, you know underutilization is is a big piece. There are some healthy reserves that are that are kicking in um, at that fund level. Um, but it's great. Uh, we're not not having to make a local you know sacrifices because of something completely out of our control. The, the yield, this is, this is probably the most um, significant um, thing. And I would encourage, I'll send this around in, uh, over, over email, just a link to the commissioner's um, December 1 letter. You can't, you can't make too many decisions based on that letter because it's, it's really in the form of a recommendation. But one of the things that the pandemic has done is that it's created a huge surplus in the education fund. Um, and that amount is actually $90 million, right? And as a result, um, the, uh, um, the, the ED fund is, is, is in a much healthier place than it's, than it's you know, ever been historically. And we're seeing that yield amount as the tax commissioner you know, looks at how much money needs to be raised from the, the taxpayers and sets this amount that's far greater than a number that we, than we've seen in the past. And the higher the yield, the lower the tax rates. So that's all very good. We typically see yields go up, you know, maybe three to 5% each year. So to see it published at the, at the 15% is, is, is huge, right? So that's going to be, be great. And, and even at that, um, that, that low rate, that's, that's actually not applying that $90 million dollars um, to, uh, um, you know, giving it back to the taxpayers. That's due to a, a number of other kind of projection type factors. Um, a lot of complexity there, um, but I'll encourage everybody to, to take a look at that, that letter. I think the big takeaway here is that we, we don't actually know what that yield's going to be until the legislature makes decisions about what to do with the 90 million. Um, the tax commissioner made a recommendation and said, hey, return half of it to the taxpayers and then take half of it and spend it on um, some kind of infrastructure type uh, needs in order to address the, the worker shortage in, in Vermont, right? Some 
uh, like technical vocational type training centers was the recommendation. But that, those are decisions that our representatives in Montpelier will have to make. So um, the excess spending threshold, this is one that we're, um, we're just going off of, a, off of a projection based on historical. We don't, we don't have this yet. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, that about 19.2, and that's just putting two and a half percent on what it was last year. We'll just have to wait and see what that one is. Uh, again, like I said before, we don't have a, a penalty phase to worry about this year, but we don't want to go wild because we could find ourselves um, in a situation where, you know, we, we get bit next year. Ben, what, what, what is the unit of that excess spending? Like, what is it, what is it referencing exactly? All right, can you can you back up from your computer, Todd, and ask that again? Your your mic went went fuzzy. Sure. Uh, what's the unit of the excess spending? What is it? What is it referencing? The excess spending threshold. It's a dollar figure, right? So if you go back to um, the, uh, uh, it's essentially if if you get into the um, uh, excess spending threshold, that's what puts you into the penalty phase. And for every dollar. So essentially, you're going to look at your per pupil spend, and if you're over that um, that excess spending threshold, the difference um, for every dollar uh, that you that you put in your budget, you have to send two to Montpelier. That's what the penalty phase is, right? So uh, that's something that we have, as a finance committee, we've always said stay out of penalty phase because that's not justifiable to our taxpayers to run our budgets like that. that answer your question. Yeah. Thanks. Wow. Thank you. Okay, and then the last one, Jim, I know you said that um, you know, we shouldn't worry about the CLA. I think that's great coaching because it is absolutely out of our control, but we do expect it to be uh, pretty massive this year. In fact, I think that's something that the legislature is probably going to have to make some decisions about as they look at that $90 million and how much to apply uh, to the education um, fund. Because uh, as we all know, real estate values just have gone wild in, in the last year with the pandemic and so much demand and housing across the state. And as a result, that's going to that's going to uh, factor into the CLA. Um, so let's talk about uh, priorities, right? Things that we might spend our, our, our money on. And this is something that I'd like to board. Uh, sorry, is there a question? Can we go back to that last screen? Sherry has been muted. So number six, while we have our legislators here, I would like an explanation on number six that running a town as a select board member, we have our grand list and then we work our budget. And then our grand list gets divided into the budget, which gives us our tax rate. So a school in the state of Vermont has a budget if across the state, the properties are selling for more and the CLA is going to come down, that means your grand list is growing. So there should be a savings because this is not like normal where five years ago, 10 years ago, that individual town CLAs came down. This, this phenomenon is happening across the state. So, well, Overall, I would think that the CLA is going to come down overall in the state. And I'm hoping you guys are looking at this and saying, or at least arguing for us and others in the state, that you have a grand list based off of the CLA and you have X price for your full budget. The number that we have to raise should come down and then the equalize, uh, the yield should also bring that down. Allison is shaking her head so she gets it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, work on ways and means if I Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, none of us in your of the legislators here serve on education. And obviously that will if that and ways and means will be addressing this, I think, pretty okay. Um, Charlie, did you guys have anything from did you discuss this at all on Saturday? No, uh, we'll be having that meeting on Wednesday, but I'm just thinking that your logic, I, I think your logic, uh, Jim, is accurate. If everyone experienced the same percentage increase in their property values and the CLA, CLA could not adjust the tax rate significantly, right? Right, or if everybody has come down even, the yes. average should. 
Right. Okay, yeah. that's where I'm getting at. Not everybody at the same rate, but the average over the state, your, your, your actual your actual grand list is going to grow and you divide into your budget. Right, so it's, it's right. Exactly. math at that point, yeah. yeah. So that should lower, it, it's and then right. lower the other equalized the yield after that. If I, if I may. Yeah, Dick, go ahead. I'm not. If I have the floor. I, okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, who has, do you have the floor or, or do I? I think you do. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the um, as the grand list grows, the rates should go down, but the amount of tax you're paying, the burden, the tax burden is is based on your school budget rather than than on the rate. So because uh, it's it's a lower rate on a, on a more highly valued property. So what you're yeah, in terms I get of the, that. Oh, all right. right, okay. What we had said already, sir, is that this. When I was the chair of finance, we did not go after the CLA. I am talking prior to the CLA that the tax rate should come down based on number one, that everyone's, the value of property in the state of Vermont has seen an increase. So your grand list of the whole state of Vermont, not individual, should take down the base rate of the education tax. Yes. And when you add the yield in, should take it down that other 11 cents at 22. I'm just putting in my thoughts, that's all. No, I'm sure you were, I, I'm, I'm just responding to that. Okay. And I guess I've already done that, so. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. And there's gonna be a whole presentation, Charlie referred to the Joint Fiscal uh, Office. We're all, we have sort of boot up on Wednesday for the legislature, and so uh, all these fiscal issues will be being addressed. Um, all the various funds will be being addressed on Wednesday. So if people are interested, they can watch it. We'll let Charlie handle it. Great. Thanks, uh, Allison. Let's um let's keep going here because uh, we got some some things I really want the, the board to to uh, kind of get an impression of as we uh, are within a couple of weeks of okay. of uh, voting on these topics. And I have a brownie ice cream. Thank you. Can I have <laughs> Okay, we're going to go on mute. He's not Check talking. That. That'd be, be great. Um, so these are five five positions in the. Um, uh, then we're going to you're going to see how these slot into the budget on the on the expense side that we've considered uh, that have been brought to the finance committee as things that we could do to kind of improve the educational experience uh, in the district. And um, I don't know, uh, Jim, Sherry, could I turn this uh, over to you guys to a give these everybody a, a break for my voice and b you've got some more insight on what these positions are about. So the first priority, as, as many of you know, that we've increased one pre-K at Woodstock Elementary School. Um, that has put a lot of demand for these little people. And so what we've noticed in order to meet our contractual obligations to our pre-K teachers and <coughs> pre-K parents, the request has been made for an additional pre-K para. Cover, nap time, cover, lunch duty, cover, teacher, uh, planning time. Um, number two on that list is, um, as many will remember, a few years back we needed to, we decided to um, to cut the K-1-2 oral language program, our Spanish teacher position. Um, it has been a goal of the board as well as the uh, administration to return that position, and so that is the cost to bring back pre-K in uh, you know, K-1-2 Spanish in all of our elementary schools. Um, it has been brought to us by our current uh, librarians. Again, another position that when we were experienced reductions in student population and um, in our ability to, to fund our programs that we did not fill a library elementary position. And so there's a request for elementary library position. Um, one of the goals of the strategic plan is to increase our international program. Uh, a current world language teacher, Colleen O'Connell at the high school, and Gabriela Durgan, who is our department chair for counseling, have been leading this work and again have, have brought it to places that, uh, for example, no other public school in the United States is currently doing. They have a program where we're having uh, communications regularly with uh, Middle Eastern students speaking French. Um, and so they, 
enrolled us in that program and done the training for that. However, meeting their own regular positions and doing that work and growing that program would require an additional 0.5 FTE. And then another piece that I'll let Jim speak to with us is around a grant writer position for 0.5. One of the things that we'd like to see is a grant writer position and um, a grant writer position should pay for itself annually. And so really what, when we add this position, we'll need to fund it in the first year in order to get give the, the person that we hire the opportunity to get grant processing. By the end of the first year, they either need to be covering their costs or we need to find somebody else because they should be able to bring enough grant annually to cover the cost of their position. Uh, but in the first year, you just need to fund it in order to give them opportunity to get the feet on the ground and, and write the grant. Is, right. there, uh, Pat, is there a percentage that we would also expect that they bring in to the place? Do they cover their costs, but we're also expecting like this amount of uh, money that's being brought in grants to the to um, to the budget as well. Like is there a percent? Is that a percentage that you would expect from them? The position, as I envision it, is one to go after mostly federal grants, mm -hmm. uh, but other private grants and other grants like that. Um, I've experienced getting a one point two million dollar Russ grant. I've experienced getting a Bill Gates grant. I've experienced those types of things mm -hmm. that grant writers have done for us. Mm -hmm. And usually, um, you know, they it's a world that they live in, like a like a fundraiser does, yep. a world I know very little about. Uh -huh. But I've seen very successful grant writers bring in anywhere from half a million to several million dollars a year. One of the things we'll experience here though is generally it needs to add we can't supplant what's already in our budget with grants so this isn't to reduce tax funding for annually budgeted items like payroll uh -huh. it's more to supplement than supplement 